To clarify, I worked for the state, driving a white van that transported police officers along with dangerous, apprehended criminals from the station to a high-security prison. These criminals included serial killers, sex offenders, and other such abominations. The van had eight seats in total, two in the front separated from the six in the back by a thick, transparent plastic panel for driver protection. I was never specifically told the crimes they had committed, but the drive could be over an hour long, which meant I often had enough to gauge from their conversations and ramblings. Some would yell and try to fight the police or escape during the ride, but the van was built rock solid to account for those types. Some were child abusers, molesters, remorseless killers who gloated about their sins. Others would beg the police to let them go. I was disgusted by these people, but never disturbed to the point of wanting to quit. After 10 years on the job, nothing fazed me anymore. In fact, I was proud of what I did. The more horrific the person, the more I liked the idea of sending them off to get what they deserved. That was until one day, when a calm, well-groomed young man was apprehended and brought to the van. Four police officers accompanied him. He was dressed in a tailored blue suit and had shiny, brown, slick back hair. Couldn't have been older than 30. At first, I mistook him for a manager or lawyer from a distance before noticing he had both hands behind his back. He nodded politely as he passed my window and was taken to the back. They unfolded the seats and sat down, and the door was slammed shut. I started the engine. This ride's an hour and a bit. You're not going to give us any trouble, are you, son? Asked one of the officers. Of course not. You guys don't get paid nearly enough for that, said the man in the suit. A few of the policemen scoffed. You're right on that one. Another officer said, rolling his eyes. My uncle used to be a cop. Ironic, I know, the man in the suit replied nonchalantly. But when he started, there were 50 in his division. Now there's about 10. Makes you wonder if all the tax money is going to nuclear warheads instead. Ha, <laughs> wouldn't be surprised. One officer mumbled to another, shaking his head. My lawyer told me not to say that because it might piss you off, but I told him you'd all let me go as soon as you heard it. The entire van erupted with laughter. I wondered what was so funny. Whatever crime he had committed, this man was bantering without a care while being deported to face life in prison or possibly the death penalty. He cracked a few more jokes and they were wrapped around his little finger. A while later, he caught my eye in the rearview mirror. You must hear all sorts of crazy stories, said the suited man, talking directly to me. Imagine being an Uber driver, but all the passengers kill people. I'd watch that reality show, he continued. Still, it must be satisfying in a weird sort of way, bringing them all to justice. Literally. Yeah, sick people like you, I replied. He stared at me through the mirror. I felt a chill out of nowhere. My blood ran cold, and I instantly regretted opening my mouth. Sick people like me? There was silence for a few seconds. The cops looked at each other awkwardly. I kept quiet. Well, cheers to you on behalf of all the sick people like me then, he finally said. I couldn't tell if he was being sarcastic. I mean it. If it weren't for you, we'd all have to walk to prison. Wouldn't want to drop the soap after that hike. Tch, he must be fun at parties. A cop smirked. I realized he was referring to me. They all laughed again. For the rest of the journey, they talked about politics, stories about other prisoners, and how early they could leave for work. They had an odd chemistry with him. The policemen acted very differently to how they usually did. They normally tried to bully the criminals or scare them into a confession. On the contrary, this time it almost seemed like they were all at a big dinner party and I wasn't invited. Perhaps they were getting some entertainment while they could. 
Or they were intimidated by him and didn't want to admit it, I thought. Some serial killers were notorious for being charming after all. Everyone's heard of Ted Bundy. I realized that even after all that chat, I still had no idea what crime he had committed. When we arrived, I opened the back doors for them to get out. Thanks for the lift. Drive safe. He grinned at me, and they took him away to the prison. The nerve, I thought. I got back in the driver's seat. About a week later, I was in between shifts and decided to take a break at a cafe in the parking lot. I walked inside and joined the queue, eyeing a big latte. As I glanced to the side, my heart skipped a beat. A man was wearing a blue suit, which looked exactly like the one that the criminal with the slicked back hair was wearing. I blinked. This man had an afro and was reading a newspaper. Same suit, perhaps, but obviously not the same guy. I exhaled with relief. I ordered my latte and sat down at a table, sipping it slowly. The man in the blue suit sat by the window, still reading the paper. I glanced at him for a while and noticed that he was just staring into it, without turning the pages. As I stood up to leave, he folded the newspaper and looked up towards me. His lips stretched into a wide, menacing smile, and he dragged his finger across his neck as he stared at me with wide eyes and tilted his head. We stared at each other for a while in silence, my heart starting to race. Then I looked around frantically, suddenly concerned for my safety. Everyone in the cafe was absorbed in their own world. It seemed like no one else had seen the gesture he had made towards me in a very public space. I rushed out of the cafe, glancing behind me every few steps, suddenly paranoid. He turned his head to lock eye contact with me, gleeful that his threat was having its intended effect on me. For the next few days, I kept hearing noises, footsteps, scratching, sometimes even the sound of someone breathing behind me. When I turned around, there would always be nothing there. Just as I thought I was turning schizophrenic, my suspicion that something was out to get me was confirmed again. I was at the grocery store on the weekend, putting vegetables in my cart, as a woman wearing a blue denim jacket and flowery dress was walking towards me. She was pushing a cart with a baby strapped to the seat. You better watch your back, she whispered as she walked past me. That caught me off guard. I whipped my head around and she kept walking without looking behind her. She wasn't talking on the phone and she wasn't with anyone else apart from the baby. That warning was undoubtedly for me. Had I just pissed off a cult of people dressed in blue? I got in the van the next day at 7 a.m. and headed off to the station. There was heavy traffic and I was convinced that I'd be late for work. I turned into a long stretch of road that was next to a steep drop, a metal railing fencing off the edge on the right. As I drove along the congested road, stopping and starting to move a few feet incrementally, I stared at the bumper stickers on the back of the white van and frowned. It's gonna be a good day. There was a sun with a smiley face next to it. The traffic finally started flowing, and I approached an intersection where cars merged from the left-hand side. A set of traffic lights came just before it. I looked at my watch. Please don't turn red. Please don't turn red, I thought. As if the universe was conspiring against me, the lights turned yellow, and as the van in front of me sped past them, they turned red. Fantastic. I slammed the brakes and looked up. I only saw the van in front for a split second, and suddenly, out of nowhere, a massive truck t-boned it violently from the left. A loud crash combined with a painful crunch stunned me into paralysis. 
Both vehicles crash through the railings and went hurtling over the edge of the cliff. The lights turned orange, then green, but I remained unmoving in silence, shaking. There was an empty space in front of me where the van had just been. I could see people through their car windows, horrified and calling the police. Eventually, I snapped out of it and drove numbly to a side road, without having fully processed the event. I parked there and called my colleagues at the station to inform them about what had just happened. A few days later, I found out that both drivers had died on impact. The truck had crashed into the van driver's side at 90 miles per hour, crushing him instantly. They thought it was a freak accident at first, until they recovered the remains and discovered the truck driver's phone, which had been in a holder stuck to his windshield. It wasn't a GPS on the phone that was guiding him. At the time of the crash, he had been using a Navigator app connected to a tracking device. The device had been tracking my vehicle. The police searched my van top to bottom and found the bugger stuck to the underside of one of the back seats. The seat that the man in the slick-backed hair wearing the blue suit had sat on on his ride to prison about two weeks ago. I pieced it together as soon as they told me. The bastard must have slipped that out from a pocket or something and stuck it to the inside of my van as soon as I pissed him off. Turned out, he was an infamous underground weapons dealer. A lot of people who had their firearms confiscated, most of them for good reason, knew that he was the guy that would supply them. So they were absolutely infuriated when he got caught. Apparently, he had a cult-like following among those people, and wearing all blue was their low-key way of supporting him. I don't want to get too political here, so I'll just say that this guy was very well-connected and had a lot of people on his side, even if it was under the radar. And I was their next target. I figured the guy must have somehow communicated to one of his cronies about the tracking device on my white van and told them to come after me. By pure chance, another white van was in front of me at the very moment they decided to strike. They must have mistaken the driver for me, knowing the vehicle was a white van in that approximate location. If those traffic lights hadn't turned red at the exact moment they did, that would have been me. That day I was supposed to die a horrific death. I quit the job that very afternoon. I packed my bags and moved to a new town. Since then, I've moved several times. The paranoia won't leave me. I think it'll stay with me for the rest of my life. Anytime I see someone wearing blue, a wave of terror sweeps over me. The same terror I felt seeing that van in front of me get pummeled and tumble over the cliff edge, knowing that should have been me. Previously, I'd always taken pride in the fact that I was a brutally honest guy, but I'm a lot more careful nowadays. And one thing's for sure, when someone makes a lame joke now, I always laugh.